Genesis 19, starting at verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. As morning dawned, The angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, O no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved." He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, and I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So why would Lot live in such a place as Sodom and Gomorrah and let alone be so associated with them let alone linger. This story really is is about Lot, and not just about Lot, but about God's grace to Lot, in spite of where he was living. So I want to call your attention to some details here. 
In verse 1, it says that Lot was sitting at the city gate. That may not mean a lot to us today, but back then, uh, city gates are kind of like the city square. So being at the city gate means he is in the thick of the city business here. He is at the town square. He's interacting with the key people, the leaders of this city. It says that he's sitting there even. Almost like he has some sort of position, because when you have a position, you sit, usually. So, there would be a constant flow of people that would make the city gate an ideal place for business, as well as for administering justice, and even just for conversation. So, if Lot wasn't one of them, he was at very least very closely associating with them and being in the thick of things there. And when he sees these two men, these two messengers, angels and messengers are the same word, when he sees them, he being the host, he bows down to the guests. That's kind of backwards as for normal protocol. So the fact that he would bow down to his guests means that he knows that they're not ordinary. And normally if you are in need of some shelter, and you are going to beg that from somebody, you would bow down to them. You know, please, may I have a place to stay for the evening? There weren't hotels back then. So please, may I stay for the evening? You would bow. But the fact that Lot bows to his would-be guests says that he sees something in them that's not ordinary. Kind of recognizes them a little bit. He has to pressure them to not stay in the square. You notice that? He really has to press them. Like, please, please come and stay with me. So that kind of raises the question, why, why is he pressing so hard? Is he just eager to, to host these important men? Or does he kind of know what is going to happen? In verse 4, it says that the whole city surrounded his house, the whole city to the last man, it says. In other words, absolutely everyone in Sodom was reprehensible here. Just prior to what we read, Abraham prays for Sodom. He intercedes and said, Lord, there's got to be some righteous people there. There's probably 50. If there's 50 there, would, would you spare this city? God says yes. And then Abraham works his way down. Lord, if there's 10, would you spare this city? And God says yes. If there's 10 righteous people there, I would spare this city. But there's not. It says down to the last man they surround the house. Verse 8. Lot makes a claim that they have come under the shelter of my roof. Back then, hospitality was very important. Your whole honor hung on whether you could provide hospitality to others. If you had the means to provide hospitality, that was an honor for you. And so, when somebody comes to stay with you, you not only provide for their needs, you also protect them by any means necessary. So, they have come under the shelter of my roof. And this was not just a Hebrew or Israelite sort of a custom. This was, this was worldwide. Pretty much every culture of the ancient Near East had these rules of hospitality. If you are looking after somebody then you are taking care of them. They are under your protection. So all cultures main, maintain that hospitality includes that protection. Even people who worship Baal. We have some texts about Baal that talked about hospitality. So this was a universal thing. Everybody did this. Everybody knew this. And this was just kind of one of those things that everybody does, right? So, Lot, by any means necessary, is trying to protect his guests. 
and those means that he offers, his offer to the crowd, that is reprehensible, it's desperate, and it's just cowardly. I have two daughters. I'll give them to you. You can do with them whatever you like. Just leave these guests alone. That's cowardly. He should have offered himself first before he offered some daughters that were dependent on him. He's very desperate. He's trying to do even the outrageous to protect his guests, but he's doing the cowardly thing. And it's just simply reprehensible because he's essentially betraying his two daughters who are in need of him, their dependence of him, to be gang raped by this crowd. It's, it's just awful that he would do that to them. And yet he calls them, this crowd, he calls them brothers. Did you notice that? He calls them brothers. He considers them family. They call him a foreigner. So he apparently thinks differently of them than they do of him. He calls them brothers. They call him a foreigner. And in this case, the bad guys get it right. Lot does not belong to these people. He is somebody who the New Testament calls righteous. And these people of Sodom are definitely not righteous. Another thing to point out, the request of this crowd. The men of Sodom want to know, not take. I mean, in uh, the NIV, it's, it's pretty direct. Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them is how it says it in the NIV. Technically, it's to know. Now, this is basically saying, this is basically about homosexual relations. There's a number of people who would like to spin this incident as simple rape. So this is not, in other words, talk, it doesn't have anything to do with homosexuality today. And then there, there's maybe some credence to that, but they don't ask to take these men, which is the normal language for rape in Hebrew. They ask to know these men, which is the normal language for husband and wife relations. There's two instances where There is rape in Genesis, and both times take is used. And there are times when husband and wife relations are are mentioned, and it's the word no. So, if this is rape, this is not what they are asking for. This This is about homosexual relations. And Lot calls this act wicked. Don't do this wicked thing. Their response, they are offended that he would judge them. Do you notice that? He calls it wicked and they seem to be offended at that. Who are you to judge us? There's a lot of that going on in our society today too. How could we possibly say that, that two consenting adults who love each other, that it's immoral that they should be together? How dare you judge? There's a lot of that going on here too, today. Maybe not with the same consequences, but people get offended when you call something that they do wicked. And in this case, this crowd... I said, they basically say, it doesn't come out in the translation, but they say, oh, you think this is wicked? We're going to be wicked to you. Because when they say, we are going to do worse to you, it's the exact same word that Lot uses for wicked. It's the exact same word. You think this is wicked? We'll be wicked to you. The main point of this episode, this whole thing that's going on here, 
why they would go into detail about this. You know, the text could have just said, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was a wicked city. God overthrew it, but he spared Lot and his family. It could have just said that. But it goes into this whole incident here of what happens. The main point of this episode is to show just how bad Sodom was. And even if we are charitable and we grant that this had nothing to do with homosexuality, we could even, let's even just, for the sake of argument, let's grant that. Let's, it had nothing to do with homosexuality. The very blatant disregard for universal laws of hospitality here is appalling. And especially to anybody of the ancient Near East, this would be morally outrageous. How could you attempt to seize somebody who is under the protection of somebody's roof as a guest in your town. This is, this is unthinkable, morally reprehensible behavior, and not just to people who have Old Testament law. This would be reprehensible to anyone at that time. So they are struck with blindness, and that blindness really parallels their moral blindness These people, they're so backward that even just common law doesn't mean anything to them. And so that even though they are right at the door, they can't find it. You notice that? It said they were right at the door, but they couldn't even find the door. The visitors don't need Lot's protection. As it turns out, he was trying to protect them. They don't need it. They can take care of themselves pretty well. Lot actually needs their protection. So they pull them back in and they strike people with blindness and that at least spares them for the evening. God doesn't need our protection either. He can take care of himself. We need to give him honor and praise. But we don't need to protect him. He can defend himself. If anybody is going to, let's say, burn a Bible of yours or something like that. We don't have to defend God. We don't have to pull out guns if somebody's going to be burning like a Bible or something. We're not, this is not the Koran. The, the Bible did not float down from heaven. We don't have to resort to violence to defend, let's say, a Bible. God doesn't need us to protect him. The angels, you notice this too, the angels offer safety not just to Lot and his family. They offer safety for others who belong to Lot. Is there anyone else in this city who belongs to you? You notice that? This is similar to how Rahab saved her whole family when Jericho was destroyed. You remember that? It wasn't just Rahab who was saved, it was everyone who belonged to her. Or when David was going to take revenge and Abigail saved her whole household from from David. There There are some times in the Bible where God doesn't just save one righteous person and pluck them out as an individual, but God saves the whole family. Because of one righteous person. God shows love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. There's a number of times in the Old Testament where God says, I I didn't choose you Israelites because you were more numerous or because you were anything great. I chose you because I made a covenant with your forefathers. I am being faithful to that covenant. And so you are receiving blessings this day because of those covenants that I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your forefathers. Verse 16. The angels have to drag Lot and family out. They have to drag them out. Lot and his family, they seem to believe that something bad was going to happen because Lot actually goes to his sons-in-law and says, "Um, this city is going to be overthrown. Get out. Let's get out. And they said, well, he was joking, right? But it says that Lot lingered. So they have to drag them out. In a manner of speaking, we don't believe in luck, but 
in a manner of speaking, Lot is really lucky to be alive. If it were up to him, he would have perished in that city if those angels hadn't dragged him out like that, him and his family. It says, verse 24 and 25, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. There was nothing left. And incidentally, to this day, we don't know exactly where Sodom and Gomorrah is located. It is wiped out completely. There's a couple locations where some people think we might have found it, but it's definitely not conclusive. God wiped this place out. He wiped it off the map even to this day with all that we are able to determine about ancient times. So just looking at this story here, thinking about Lot, the way this story is told and the details that were given, Lot is shown as both righteous and flawed. He's both here. He's actually, he's just like you and I. For all of us as believers, we are both righteous and we are deeply flawed, aren't we? In 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, it says, Lot lives in this city and he's a righteous man. And he knows this place is wicked, but he also, he still likes it there. He's a, he, this is a wicked city, but he likes it there. He's attached to it. So 2 Peter, it says, Righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So he knew what was going on. He was tormented by what was going on. But he also liked it there. So he knows it's wicked. He was tormented over their lawless deeds. It says, He recognized the angels. He recognized that these were no ordinary travelers passing through. He bows to them. That's weird. These are some special people coming through here. He begs them to come under his roof and not stay in the city square. He's, he's adamant to show them hospitality. He makes them a meal himself. You know, he doesn't signal servants or his wife to do it. He does it himself. So he's showing his righteousness here. But he was at the city gate where all the important business was done, hobnobbing with the, the movers and shakers of the city. He calls them brothers, as we pointed out. He was marrying off his daughters there which means he's putting roots down there. He has to be dragged out of the doomed city, and his wife looks back, turns into a pillar of salt. So he's tormented about what's going on here, but he's at the same time he's attached to it. I, I love it here. I hate, hate what's going on here, but I love it here. It's, you see the tension there? We, see, we can see Lot's foolishness of liking what is sinful, but can we see it in ourselves? This is not just Lot. This is all of us. We get attached to sinful things that we ought not get attached to. There's this couple of verses that came to mind from First John on this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We need to have a distinction between us and this world. We can't be attached to it. We can't love it. Christians are aliens in a foreign land. Don't get attached. We are sojourners here for a time. The real kingdom that we belong to is coming. 
And Jesus is the king of that kingdom. We can't get attached. All of this is going to be swept away at some point. We are not brothers with this world. We don't belong here. These are not our people. We have neighbors, but only believers are brothers and sisters. So, we're here for a time, but we don't belong here. We can't get attached to here and now. Another lesson from this story. God does not sweep away righteous with the wicked. This is what Abraham pleaded with God just beforehand. Lord, surely you won't sweep away the righteous with the wicked, will you? What if there's 50 people there? What if there's 10? You wouldn't sweep them all away together, would you? And God says, no. And God proves it in this story. He does not sweep away the righteous with the wicked. There are only four good people in that city. And God made sure that they were not swept away. It says, right, after, right in Second Peter, right after, it mentions Lot. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So, even though Lot was attached to this city, even though it was an evil city, God had mercy on him because Lot was a righteous man. God's grace was upon Lot. God was merciful to him. It says that right in the text. Same verse where it says he had to be dragged out of the city. God was merciful to him. I think this is our story too. God's grace is not something that we choose and can take credit for. God's grace drags us out of sin into salvation. We have to be dragged out of it. Of course, there are some sins that we think are reprehensible, but there are some that we kind of keep as pets too and kind of tolerate. We have to be dragged out of it. God's grace and our salvation is no thanks to us. Lot would have died if it were, he were left to his own choices, and we would be damned if left to our own choices too. Lot's story shows what the New Testament says explicitly. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And even this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Lot couldn't boast about saving himself there at all. And neither can we boast in the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. God saves us, dragging us out even. This is God's word to us. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, thank you for your grace that you show to us where even though we become attached to wickedness and this world and the disorder of this world, that Lord, you still show us mercy. And Lord, you redeem us as, as righteous and though righteous, we are flawed as we are. So Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Help us to recognize when we are attached to the wrong things and be ready to move and to leave whenever we need to. Because you are our Lord and we look to you for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.